Team Kestova, welcome back to the auditorium. Today, we get into the basics of wind design and finding velocity pressure. And if you're popping in here just to get a quick answer for your questions, or if you're just in love with the process of learning structural engineering, consider subscribing down below. Every little bit that each and every one of you helps out allows me to help out others in return. And don't think for a second that all of you aren't helping me just as much. Uh, since starting this channel, I can't believe how much I've gotten more into depth on subjects that I was unfamiliar with. So I appreciate every single one of you being here. Let's get into today's problem. I've made this example up off the top of my head. We are gonna use the location of Portland, Oregon. It's gonna be a commercial structure, and we're gonna say that the structure is relatively at sea level, and you'll see why that, that bit of info was important. Um, in plan, we have a 20 foot by 20 foot structure, and then in elevation, that structure is also 20 feet high. Wow, such architecture. Since we're located in Oregon, they actually fall under the use of the OSSC for commercial structures, which is the Oregon Structural Specialty Code but it's not its own completely separate code. It's actually just continued upon and clarified or added to the IBC because the IBC, the International Building Code, has also been adopted into law in the state of Oregon. So you have the OSSC, which permits the use of the IBC, and the IBC permits the use of the ASCE 7 First thing we're gonna do is determine our risk category. And for this, I'm just gonna give that to you, and I'm gonna assume that this is a risk category two structure. But because we go through everything on this channel, let's jump over into the code to show you specifically where the risk category is located for all of you who don't have that for your example. We've jumped into the ASCE 716 for this example, and we're in section 1.5, classification of buildings and other structures, risk categories. And if we scroll down here, you're gonna be located in table 1.5-1, and this is where they give criteria for you to help you determine what your risk category is for the structure that you're designing. We've now jumped over to chapter 26 of the ASCE 716, and this is where we will remain for the remainder of the video. They give a little cheat sheet as to what you need to do to accumulate your criteria for the design of your structure for wind. We need to do basically each one of these steps in order to get our velocity pressure, which is that step right there, actually. Then from there, once you get that information, in future videos, you then move on into the design of your structure uh, under wind loads. And there's a bunch of different methods you can use in order to do those designs. Um, but again, we're just focusing on velocity pressure today. So let's determine our basic wind speed, V. In order to do this, we flip to page 252, and you'll see this wind speed map that is given in the 716. Portland, Oregon is gonna be right there, red dot. Um, and you can interpolate between these lines and that number right there is your V in miles per hour. And then in parentheses right here, um, that is your V in meters per second. For us here in the US, we're gonna stick with miles per hour. And because we can interpolate, we'll say that this falls, I would say at 97 miles per hour. So that's per the 716. Let's go write that down. But that's not the only place we need to look. Another great resource is the ATC Hazards website. Let's jump over there to see if there's any discrepancies. Per the ATC, under risk category two, which we've determined is our structure, they give uh, a V of 97 miles per hour. So that aligns with what the ASCE 7 had. So great. Let's write that down though, because there's a few other places to check. As I mentioned above, we have, I'll go green here, we also have a state specific code uh, that we should be checking to make sure that there's no differences uh, from the state level that they've mandated a different type of wind pressure be used uh, based on their code requirements. So let's go check the OSSC now for our V. Per the OSSC, they give you this table and this is for risk category one, two, three, and four, buildings and other structures, that's us, risk category two. And they break it down into county within the state. Portland, Oregon is located uh, within the county of Multnomah. So let's scroll down our table here. We're under risk category two right here. That gives us a wind speed V of 98 miles per hour, but they also give you a footnote C. So let's go check out what that footnote is. The basic uh, design wind speed for buildings and structures in this region with full exposure, so wind exposure category D, 
to Columbia River Gorge, which is a gorge that's right next to Portland, shall be 125 miles per hour for risk category one, 135 for risk category two, okay, and so on and so on. Risk category two is us. Now, we're designing in Portland. We are not saying for this example that we are in this gorge area. This is a special wind region, is what this is called. Um, but so, for us today, drop my pen. I'm back with the pen. So for us today, we don't have to worry about this special wind region, but we will talk about those. All right, so relatively the same, but still one mile per hour difference, you know? Gang, we're still not done. We have one more thing to check all the way down to the city level. So the city of Portland may have design criteria that differs from these three other options that we had. They give everything from soil and foundation to snow loading requirements, wind, which we're on today, and you keep going, seismic. They dabble a little bit in each one of those, and it's another area you're gonna need to check as an engineer if you're designing a building in Portland. Well, here we are with wind. Risk category we know is two. They give uh, a wind speed of 98 miles per hour. So, all right, so we have a velocity of 98 miles per hour determined. One final note that I wanna talk about is special wind regions. So if you see here, we're back in the ASCE 716, and they call out cross hatching on map indicates a special wind region. So we have all of this special area wedged in between very, very close proximity to Portland. Basically what that means is that there are additional requirements that you need to look into to check your wind speed because it could vary rapidly. And the reason that those locations usually arise is for instance, uh, right here, you have Mount Hood, which is you know an 11,000 foot tall mountain peak that sits just an hour and a half away from Portland. Those wind speeds, obviously, when you get over to the mountain, increase dramatically. And then as well, along the border, um, if I draw a different color here, between Washington and Oregon has the Columbia River Gorge, which is this massive river um, with these huge cliffs on the side that drop down. And that region creates crazy wind speeds as well that differ um, from Portland, which is only you know 20 minutes away. So because of that, wind can get a little tricky uh, because you can't just do kind of a general state level or city level. It really just depends on the type of environment uh, and the topography that you're building in. As you can see, there's so many ways to find your wind velocity. The takeaway from this is be careful of local jurisdictions, make sure you've checked every single one of them, and then be cautious of special wind regions where you're building your building. Those two things are the most crucial things you can do when first determining wind velocities to then ultimately design under wind criteria. Next on our list is finding the wind directionality factor, KD. That is in section 26.6. See, this little cheat sheet is just amazing. I'm basically just saying it verbatim. Here we are, and today we're finding the velocity pressure for our main force resisting system. That gives us in this chart, a K sub D of 0.85, it's that simple. Next, we're determining our exposure, section 26.7. With this, we find ourselves back on the same page, exposure right here, and you'll move up to 26.7.3, and you'll be given exposure classes B, C, and D, and then you will give it, be given an explanation as to uh, what that criteria means in order to fall under that exposure class. So you compare your building's parameters and see if that your building falls under one of those exposure classes, and then you get to use that exposure class. Exposure B, if we start reading, for buildings and other structures with a mean roof height less than or equal to 30 feet, ours is 20 feet, exposure B shall apply where the ground surface roughness, as defined by surface roughness B, prevails in the upward direction of the distance, blah, 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 blah. Goes in a little further there. Um, they start talking about surface roughness, and you're like, where the heck does that come in? You actually backtrack one paragraph and you're also given surface roughness categories. Again, listed in B, C, and D classification. Surface roughness B, if we look at that, is urban and suburban areas, wooded areas, or other terrain with numerous closely spaced obstructions that have the size um, of single family dwellings or larger. Well, we're in an urban and suburban area. That's us right there. So we've confirmed surface roughness B 
And that then allows us to confirm that we have an exposure class of B. All right, beautiful. Next on our list is KZT. In order to find KZT, they actually give you a diagram. This is on page 267. And this factor has to do with the, again, the topography of your surroundings of where your structure is built. And they give you this great diagram right here to help illustrate what they're talking about. Um, they give you all of your variables within those diagrams. And then below here, based on what you determine for those values, um, they give other parameters that you then have to find K1, K2, and K3, because ultimately you drop down and you use this final equation to find KZT. However, for our case in Portland, Portland is relatively flat. For my example today, I'm gonna to say that our building is located in a flat area. Since that is the case, we can actually dodge all of this. And if we scroll down, uh, we are permitted right here to take KZT equal to 1.0. So this doesn't apply to us, it's just 1.0 today. Leave a comment down below if you'd like to get into an example where we need to dive in and figure out KZT. That's cataloged, let's head back to that cheat sheet table. Next, ground elevation factor, K sub E. This is pretty straightforward. This factor is just based on the elevation of your structure relative to sea level. For us, we specified in our problem today that our structure, since it's next to the river, that river then is relatively at sea level. Portland is, is a low-lying city. So KE is permitted to be taken as 1.0. Um, and if it wasn't, again, it's a direct relationship to the elevation uh, above sea level. And they give you this chart right here that you can use to determine am I 3,000 feet above sea level? Am I higher than that? You know, am I going up a mountain or whatever? Then with that, you directly link it across and you get to apply your K sub E that correlates to your elevation relative to sea level. Boom, but for us, again, it's just 1.0. Next and finally, we get to find our velocity pressure. But wait, there's still one more variable that we do need to determine. But let's head over to section 2610 because it's contained in there. Back at section 2610 and we will be using this, and I'll go green here, the equation specified right here to find QZ, which is our velocity pressure. That is ultimately what we've been trying to find today. But you'll notice that there is this K sub Z value still here that we haven't determined yet. If we scroll up, that is actually the velocity pressure uh, coefficient, and that is it just has to do with the exposure that you've determined for your structure as well as the height of your structure. So the height above ground, Z, for us, we have a 20 foot high structure that we started with. This guy right here. And then we're gonna scroll across. We have an exposure that we determined to be B. Right here, that's gonna send us down. And that's gonna give us this info right in here. So that gives us a KZ of 0.62 but it also has a parenthesis of 0.7 uh, with a footnote A. So let's just check that out quick. The footnote says use 0.7 in chapter 28. Um, exposure B when Z, the height of your structure, is less than 30 feet. Well, we are less than 30 feet, but that is for chapter 28. So that is after you find your parameters in chapter 26, which is what we're doing today, and you start actually applying it to the design of your structure. So for us, we can ignore that footnote right now and we can use 0.62, but you'd wanna remember that. Keep it off to the side because we fall into that criteria and we would need to use that potentially at a later date. KZ, 0.62, KZT, 1.0, KD, 0.85, KE, 1.0, and our velocity in miles per hour of 98, I'll say MPH just to keep everybody clear. This factor right here, which I'll put in green, has been thrown in here in order to uh, convert your miles per hour 
into a uh, pounds per square foot, a PSF. All of that equals 12.95 PSF. I think it's safe to round up to 13 PSF. And that right there is your velocity pressure. To be clear, as an engineer, that does not mean that from this point forward, you just take 13 PSF and you apply it to the you know, the face of your structure to design it for wind forces. You then need to take this variable and apply it to other equations in the next following chapters, 27, 28, 29, 30, um, depending on the type of method you use to design your structure for wind. If you found yourself learning something new about wind design or about the ASCE 7, uh, or you know, just building codes in general and how to move through them as a structural designer, consider subscribing down below and starting your engineering journey with Team Kesteva today. We'd love every single one of you in this auditorium. We're always jam-packed, but we can always get one more seat. Or if you need more helpful tips on all things structural engineering, check out one of our videos in the channel anytime. This is Rich with Team Kesteva. Have a happy and safe Halloween. Don't eat too much candy, but really eat like a ton of candy. And I'll see everybody next time. Later.